So actually, this friend of mine, she related this phenomenon to me many years ago. She has two daughters who are about the same difference in age as mine, but uh, they're one's just about to graduate from high school. So this is probably about 10 years ago that she mentioned this to me. But she said that her kids would go through her phone and look at like pictures of them when they were much younger, like much smaller, like. I don't know, two and four or something like that. Sure. Of them on like vacations or whatever. And they would say, oh, I remember that when we went. And it's like, no, you actually you no, don't remember that. No You've way. You've seen you photos because they would yeah. tell their mom, oh, remember that time we went to such and such and such. And she's like, you don't remember that. You saw a photo of you there, but you don't actually remember that. And I think that that's it's like a pseudo memory phenomenon. And I think that's what most people most people have that as a syndrome of Christmas. Yeah. And they're trying to recreate what they saw on TV. And then but then they're saying, oh, oh, I just want it to be like it was when I was a kid. And it's like, no, it wasn't like that when you I were mean a kid either. Okay. Hi, everyone, and welcome to Royal Path. I'm your host, Andrew. And tonight, real quick, I was going to ask Cyprian and Father, because we're already kind of roll. And I don't want to, like, squash it. But no, as good. there's, I've noticed that there's a couple different Christmas aesthetics. There's, like, the white lights. Like, there's, like, the classy, mm -hmm. refined Christmas. And then there's, like, the tacky, like, multicolored mm -hmm. plastic Santa with, like, chipped paint and mm -hmm. stuff um and then like the like you know our, and then there's like christmas jazz over here with like the soft piano and then over here you have like brenda lee and like you know mm -hmm. elvis and stuff like that mm -hmm. what do you guys prefer I, I like tacky christmas myself yeah i'm, yeah. A, ta I'm a tacky christmas guy i'm a tacky christmas guy yeah that's the, that's all i got to say about that what about you father uh, I don't really understand the other one, so I guess tacky Christmas. Tacky Christmas. Yeah, I don't really understand the other one. It's the like white, the white white Christmas weird. The, it's like a snow thing. I don't know what it, what it, what they're doing. It's like refined. It's like they would be listening like slow Christmas like jazz, like and like we're talking real vanilla jazz here, like real like by the numbers christmas jazz with like white lights and um is that like muted, the muted color muted colors though like the colors are always muted father yes cyprian yes absolutely yeah. and yes father it's like an anthropology it's like a very yeah. like anthropology yeah yeah okay. i got you yeah yeah because i've known other people that do like the white stuff they're like they're like really into that like that's the stuff it's like no i like everything being on theme and on color and then also like um buying like pre-made trees like pre-decorated trees it comes with like a kit so all the ornaments match all the like tinsel matches all the lights match and it's like you know it feels very non-participatory that aesthetic like that aesthetic does not feel like people are participating in it i think the thing about tacky christmas is that it's like at least this this was how it was. So definitely growing up, it was totally tacky Christmas. Mm -hmm. But one of the cool things about growing up in in my house that we always loved was decorating the tree because exactly as you said, out comes the box of mm -hmm. ornaments and they're just a absolute hodgepodge. Yeah. There's, th there's things from two generations ago that were like from my grandmother you know what i mean and there's little these weird little elves from like the 30s and then you have like cool gold stuff then you have like stuff we made as kids and like and it's all in there 
like commemorative Batman and Robin like re-released exactly. in like 1996. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. And there's something so cool about like the because in that way it's like it's it's a weird sort of om- it's not tradition like especially not capital T tradition but it's like an homage to tradition. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And there's something so special about that, I think. My kids love it every year. They yeah. love it. They like they love putting their stuff up and it's like, oh, I remember this. And like you only see it once a year. So it's mm-hmm. like, oh, this mm-hmm. is really cool. I remember this. Mm-hmm. And like they've grown up obviously a year mm-hmm. since then. So I think it's I think it's great. And the other one. Yeah, I think non-participatory, I think, is the it's like there. I did it. Yeah. I got it. And, but it's still very neat and sterile and like very. So you, mm-hmm. I think you could probably do it in a way that's like nice and feels homey, you know, I think. But the way I'm thinking of it, it's like, eh, you know, and I don't know. I'd, I'd rather just, you know, have the stuff that doesn't make sense. And you can see the tape holding mm-hmm. it together in the middle and everything. So, yeah, I, I, I like that. Uh, I like the drag it back out every year. Mm-hmm. Aesthetic for yeah. sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um. So I don't we I don't think we have a topic for tonight, at least one picked out yet through guidance. We always find we always manage to get there. But one thing I wanted to ask real quick, and I don't think this has to be the topic, but I do think it's worth talking about, at least for 2024 predictions. <laughs> oh, that'd be good. That I, I don't know. Actually, so do, that we might really, be, yeah. do we really want to do that? Sorry. <laughs> hey, I try not to I try not to. You know, that's none of my business. You know, Father, I try and live in the moment, okay? <laughs> you know, with God, where he exists, where eternity is. I try and stay right here. That's it. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, but uh, I actually have been at, I've been watching this guy, and I'm not going to shout out because he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't need to be shout out on YouTube. He does a lot of commentary on music. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that he returns, one of the things that he does that I like is he really, really takes down the idea of um, gatekeepers, of like Mm -hmm. people who gatekeep music and talk about like, okay, sure, Rolling Stone just loves, like the the guy in New York is like writing the article about Death Crips, just absolutely loves Death Crips or whatever, you know? And then you- Surprise, surprise, a guy in, in New, I bet he's in Brooklyn. Exactly. And I think that that's the point or the guy in L.A., you know, that's like the like vegan in L.A. who mm-hmm. like you who lives possibly... in Santa Monica. Yeah. Who's mm-hmm. like just loved Arcade Fire back like in 2010, mm-hmm. you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. One of the things that he talks about is the fact that it's like, yeah, sure. You have these bands that are like l- beloved by critics. But when you look at their follows on Spotify, they have like 250,000, whatever, like mm-hmm. 300,000. And then you look at like a band like Daughtry or like Nickelback or like um, mm-hmm. Seether. And so the video is like, what is butt rock? And so he's kind of talks about like the misunderstood genius of butt rock. And I will never die on that hill. It is not th- something I'm looking to defend, but it made me think of like does art being accessible because that's his whole thing is the accessibility Uh, uh, does art being accessible detract from it like because i would argue because his whole thing is like the fact that this music has hooks and is produced and pretty much written as pop music meaning typical like typical verse chorus verse chorus bridge chorus song is done in under five minutes like, does that being written that way as a way to appeal, does that negate its impact on art? And I kind of was like, well, I think that would be something to talk about with Father, because, I mean, obviously he was heavily into the art world, still is. And, like, does it, is it, like, does it make something bad to make it more accessible? Or is is something being inaccessible and not necessarily inaccessible for inaccessible sake, but is something more complex? Is there like more inherent meaning? Do you got? Do you see what I'm? Is there's actually there's clear? actually a way there's actually a way deeper principle that's that's probably appropriate here because it relate. I think it could relate to like liturg- making liturgical changes, like changing the liturgy to make because that accessibility thing is something that like 
is a temptation within the church always, right? Like to make services more accessible. But then at the same time, like there, there has to be a level like, if, well, if, if we're talking about like church Slavonic and Cyril and Methodius, that it's like, well, there also is a level where it's like, well, there is a certain requisite for accessibility. And this like, is kind it's of got the, to be in a language people understand. And this is kind of the conversation I wanted to have right here is like, I was mm -hmm. like, where does this principle lie? In what way does mm -hmm. this actually play out? Mm -hmm. truthfully what, what is the royal path of accessibility as versus well what's the reverse a cult because it, it's not hoobastank and it's not nickelback like it's not that level of accessibility but it's also not whatever guy playing guitar loops for two hours on an album you know like <laughs> you know like it's it, and like yeah. sampling like an 808 to make like weird drum beat. oh the the um the uh project what's the project called the the it's like 80 hours or something like that and it's like it's about like um dementia it's supposed oh, to like have you seen yeah. have you heard of this project yeah where it's supposed to like you listen all the way through and it simulates you it's it's meant to simulate a person losing their mind to dementia basically it's that like it's that's like the most occult i would say that you would go in in music right Sounds like a way and then Huba, Huba stank is like the other side <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> because i mean I, how did you how do you do that name i don't know, <laughs> I don't know. well yeah. yeah yeah the accept that accessibility question is uh well can, hey can i i'm sorry i'm sorry Father, I don't, I don't want it. But can I, can I load this because this actually just happened? Because Father, I reached out to you about yeah. a friend who was looking for a parish to go to in the Denver, Colorado area, and you mm -hmm. helped out because he had, he had felt the call mm -hmm. and had gone, decided I'm going to church, went to a church, found a church, went to the, went to the parish. And he was like, it was all in, it was all in Slavonic, obviously, but he was like, oh, it was a Russian church all in Russian. And it was interesting because his description of it, I could see how like, oh, having not only no one who was there who was walking him through it, not understanding a word of the language, but then, you know, his description of it, and I totally got it of like, oh, there's people moving to the left, and then I was trying to get out of the way of people moving to the right, and people are shuffling around icons, and I'm just trying to stay out of the way, you know what I mean? And I was like, ah, it's so completely foreign that there was nothing to latch on to. Yeah. Whereas if he would have, there's some requisite level of being able to latch on that can then open the rest, but if you don't have that requisite level, it's like totally a cult yeah 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 I, I yeah i think this is interesting i mean we just i just had a conversation really good conversation yesterday actually during um the agape meal about this um it's been coming up a lot in regards of this kind of tension between people wanting to become orthodox and then just feeling the tension of being western you know and like and like what does that mean um, and even like, I think Andrew, Andrew yesterday had a great quote. Um, it wasn't great in the sense of like profound, like explicitly, but it was great in the sense of like, it really kind of opened things up for me. But like, he was like, I didn't really appreciate Western culture until I became Orthodox. Cause I think, I think you were talking about the contrast, Andrew, just like being pulled out, like Orthodoxy pulled you out of the fish tank, basically in mm -hmm. a way that you would never be able to be pulled out of the fish tank and like, Oh, I'm not in the fish tank. The fish tank was kind of great. You know, um, that was very insightful for me. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think this is going to be interesting because I was talking to mother Elizabeth about this today. And it's one of those things where I'm at a little bit of a disadvantage because I just, don't like <laughs> like the eastern the eastern mindset and aesthetic and everything is all well, it's just it's kind of been the inverse for me and i'm not even trying to be that guy like oh, i was wearing toms before everyone else it's not like that but um just some of the things that i, I think we're going to get into right now because of my own kind of whatever unique background this things made sense for me so for instance some things we talked about was like 
one of the things I didn't like about, and I don't like about the kind of quote unquote Western aesthetic and the Western paradigm is this unnatural need for order, unnatural need for like everything has to, you know, kind of be very like efficient and like kind of like make sense and stuff. And like, I appreciate it. Um, but like we were talking about like the chaos of the Eastern like li- of the liturgy and the church. And it's like, like, when do I make the sign of the cross? And like, when do you bow? And like, when do you do all the things? It's like, you can't find rhyme or, rhyme or, or rhythm. And for me that I was like, that's one of the things I've, it, and it's also funny too, how when you become orthodox in the right sense, right. The more you try to do that, the more it like keeps you from becoming orthodox, you know, it's yeah. like, and I just see that as oh, like, Oh, that's a, can you, can you just, can we linger on that for a second? Yeah. Yeah. Like, well, let me just say this real quick and then pull me back in, which is the problem is that that's not how life is kind of what you were saying earlier, Cyprian, and that's not how life is. Um, and so, you know, to me, the West in the sense of like, and again, let me just the qualifications, love, much love to all my Western my brothers. God bless you. It's been good. We brought this up a couple of weeks ago and I've had some good comments and I'll maybe we'll do like a whole Western right show. I don't know. But like, I'm going to double down on some things here just because it's like, <laughs> um, like I just. Before long before becoming Orthodox and going to like a mass, it never like it was just like, what is like it didn't make it's it's like being in the uncanny valley for me. Um it's like being in a, um a Tim Burton suburban like scene. There's just some it, it's just it's it's not natural. Like the kind of um there's this great line from a guy, uh Kevin Prosh, but is this line which describes what I'm talking about exactly, like the rhythm of weeping. Mm. Like the rhythm of weeping. To me, that's the East. To me, that's that's what I find is like the rhythm of weeping, right? That kind of paradox and tension. Um, that's life, right? So the more that you seek to let go of that and enter into all the things of life, like the unresolved threads, you know, all the things we were just talking about, like to me, that is what helps you approach having quote unquote like an orthodox you know mindset or phronema however you want to say it the problem is is that i think you know you get all these different takes on it um but really the the more you lean into the difficulties of life the things that we find unsatisfying like in our society um i think the more that you can become quote unquote um, not just orthodox, but knowing what that means is you can begin to really be in a place to where you can be saved. What are you talking about? I know that's a big statement. Let me let me throw something out to you. I was thinking about this today. One of the big differences that I find, like there's a gentleman I kind of been chatting back and forth with. He's older, way older guy, you know, and um, he's very characteristic. And it hit me today, very characteristic. But I, I find there's these things that like you have to, they have to change in order for you to be truly orthodox, you know, like one of them is an orthodox mindset doesn't blame God. (laughs) You know what I mean? Something goes wrong. The default isn't like, why is God doing this to me? Right. The default isn't like why, you know, finding some way to put it on God. Right. Like you don't like, that ethos, that mindset, you just, it, it's just, it's not there. Yeah. There's, there's just not even a, um, there's just not, what, what, there's just not even like a space in the framework where that's even like part of the reality. It would be like, I, I don't know, like a purple, like a, the, oh, why is there, why is this purple elephant doing it? It's like, yeah. no, 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 there's not, it's just not a space for it. That's just not there. And, and I can say this because it's one of those things where, there is a difference between you know this on a kind of like rational, rationally, um, that kind of discursive way versus like your heart's changed, which is like, there was a point in time in my life when I would, you know, going, oh, why is God, blah, 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 blah. But something happens and then you that, that really begins to change. You realize like, that's absurd. Not too different from when I remember waking up one day and being like, oh my gosh, my dad's been right this whole time. Yeah. 
<laughs> like, yeah. like my dad's been right this whole time. Very I, similar. Yeah. I've been blaming everybody. It's everyone else's fault why I'm in jail. It's everyone else's fault why I got five tickets on driving with a suspended license. You know what I mean? Blaming everybody for everything else versus you wake up that one is like, it's all my fault. And it's so, like, for me, that's, that was a, so clear. It was so clear. It's all my fault. It's, it's, I'm, I'm responsible, you know? And that's something that's just on so many levels. I mean, you, you see it for, you know, I'm just, I don't want to spend a whole episode picking on Rome and the, and the stuff again, but you just see it with the lack of like just acknowledging anything. And I would submit to you, it just, this is human, this is human nature, fallen human nature in the sense of, you know, Adam, right? What would have happened if Adam had repented right then and there and said, like, nope, it's my fault, Lord. I wasn't watching my wife. I wasn't doing what I should have done. So on that sense, it's just a human problem. I acknowledge that. I don't don't get me wrong. I see that, right? But what I'm talking about is this this need to like the artificial the artificial kind of like nature of which we as Western people kind of put everything nice and neat. Um and when that is when that's broken, when that when that kind of like rhythm is broken, we're just like, clearly this is an act of God. <laughs> like, like nothing would ever break this like smooth, clean, whatever I have. And clearly this must be an act of God. You see it all the time. You see with people when they have a problem with like something with their house or something where their car breaks down or something with their clothing or something with like their child's like schedule. You know what I mean? And they just that plays out in all these ways of like superficiality, pettiness, and all this and that. And I just forgive, I just, forgive me, Father. Are we saying? Are you saying instead of taking the blame yourself, instead of saying, "Oh yeah, this is this is actually this this is my fault," or are you saying that there was that there was no one to blame and that they're blaming God? Like, what is the both? It's both. Okay, it's both. Okay, it's both it's both because. Because getting back to the thing, it's like, you know, it, it's it's crazy for people. They, people have to have some sort of villain. And the reason why people need a villain is because they need some sort of a clean resolution. They need to they need to be like, oh, man, like. It's this and this and that. And like, we but, but forget, forgive me again, father, but why are we not like. I, I And I don't know. I, I And this is probably an Eastern thing. And I think I adopted it early on in like adopting sort of and I mean east like far east but like I just remember this principle very young when I got involved in like the occult and everything was that I, one of one of my teachers and it stuck with me forever because it was about it was about disease and it was about unfortunate events and it was like no it's all your fault every single thing that happens to you is your fault if you're sick it's your fault and it's like that stuck with me to say to such a level that like I and and becoming orthodox that starts to even itself out in a way to where I could understand like because before that it was like a lot of shame and which was pride right, right. of like thinking about myself and the pride in there I didn't have the ability to like accept it in humility that like oh yeah I could have made different decisions here but I feel like that like the the blaming God because I mean that's that's what like on on the Adam note it feels like He's like, no, the woman that you that you gave that you me gave as a helper, me. You, you gave, gave me, me this one. Right. So he's blaming mm -hmm. the woman. Mm -hmm. And by blaming the woman, he's blaming then God, because eventually, mm -hmm. if you don't blame yourself, you're going to have to you're going to it's going to go in a causal chain to, to you blaming God, unless you're going to take it on yourself. It seems mm -hmm. to me. No, that's it. And that's why orthodoxy isn't just about kind of checking boxes and having the stuff, it's like it really is. A, it's it is repentance on the fundamental level of being, right? Repentance. Ah, because of, that's repentance. Exactly. Okay. Oh, right? and that's okay. Why, okay. And that's, I got it now. You know what I mean? And that's why getting to you know sin and the original sin in that sense, you know, of like, hey, that that original autonomy. You know that sin of autonomy and and uh, an unwillingness of repentance and an unwillingness to actually look and to see what we have done, right? And to blame I don't know. I don't know how I missed that. That was repentance. I don't know how I missed it. I'm yeah. just I'm blind. 
it's it's so it's so it's so that's the thing is like that's why it's crazy because you know a lot of people are in and you know I'm gonna make something kind of explicit that I feel is like implicit in in a lot of you know not what I say because I'm just I'm trying to do my best I fail often but I'm trying to do my best to just really kind of point to the fathers and the way of the church and all that but like in a simple plain way of saying it. It isn't just about checking the boxes of like, that's that's a very Western thing. I want to be Orthodox. Okay, when do I make my cross? What fathers can I read and not read, or at least think I read and quote? You know what I'm saying? What kind of thing? What, what are all the things I can check the box on so I can be like, see, I've got it. I've done all the things. That's like a, such a Western thing. You know what I'm saying? But the reality is, is like, no, when your whole life begins to become like getting, adopting and internalizing these changes of, of, disposition right so for instance like everything about being orthodox is like saying like yeah god didn't god alone is pure and innocent like and 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 not in some kind of weird calvinist like your poop and like not like that but just really seeing like oh this is what happened to the fall and i'm carrying this right i'm carrying this and again not the guilt in that sense right but just the, the the consequences of that fall being death but death, you know, when we turn away from God and blame him and like, isn't that death? Isn't that spiritual death? Isn't that spiritual death to really, you know, like see the source of life and all that is good and, and, and really, you know, kind of like rebel against God in that sense, you know? Um, so I think that that's the kind of thing is like all of the, all the weird idiosyncrasies that just kind of drive us crazy um, that don't make sense. When people like are like when we as Western people are looking at, at orthodoxy, looking at the quote unquote East, you know, I, I think that there's something really deep for us to look at in regards of the way that we think. If watch what I'm saying here, the way that we think reality should be orientated and patterned, not the way it is, because I would submit that's that's one of the biggest problems is that if you're raised here in the States or in the West, quote unquote, you really don't have a grip of how reality actually works. Um, there's, there's no way the cross could be victory in the West. There's like, because, it's, no, he didn't. Well, there's, a, there's a lack of hierarchy. Like the entire modern West is built around destroying the idea of properly ordered hierarchy. Everything is built to do that. Well, the thing is, is if you think about it this way, that, that intention of, blame the guy, blame authority, you know, I mean, mm-hmm. whether it's going to be, you know, King George is the problem, which I'm not, I'm not arguing, <laughs> you know, whatever, mm-hmm. don't get me wrong. You know what I mean? But that, uh, that approach to everything just, just boils down. That's why it's so hard for people because, right. We like, this is going to be an interesting portion. Cause I know this might get some people's ire up, but like, when you talk about like hierarchy and, and a proper engagement with hierarchy, you can have those people who are like, let's say, a cradle, right? And like, no, you don't understand. We've never, like, even that, even the way that you're thinking about the approach to hierarchy, that's even like a Western thing because we've never really had that type of deference, blah, blah, blah. But I would submit that's actually a deviation. You know, that's something that's kind of been picked up. And really, like, for instance, you know, in the States, there's this whole thing with, like, parish councils and, like, stuff like that. That's like not that's something that that's an innovation from the west that as the church has come in and tried to like model after congregationalism so it's this desire to feel like oh you know democracy is the way that you do it because democracy is sophisticated right whereas like hierarchy and having like the priest or having whoever as like the guy you kind of answer to that's so backwards and tribalism blah 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 democracy- but it's in the name isn't it father presbyter Yes. Like it's, it's yeah. that's the, that's the yeah. elder and you yeah, defer yeah. Yeah, to yeah. your elder like the yeah, ancients yeah. would have understood that. Yeah, yeah. It, 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 like, what's his title? Oh, he's presbyter. So, OK, well, we just go there. There's no. So you're saying, Father, there needs to be a Reichstag at our church <laughs> in which you can seize all the power and finally do away with the parish council so that you can just be this. Well, street. well, what I'm saying is what I'm Father saying Palpatine. Is, what I'm saying is when when you have. And this is the thing that people need to kind of wrap their minds around. When you actually do your best to do the thing, you don't need that. Because 
as as someone as a as someone leads and they humbly submit themselves to God and they really try to do the thing they really try to actually serve Christ and serve people and love Christ and do the best they can which means when they make mistakes they humble themselves right when they when they really try to put into practice the teachings of our Lord and really try to live out the ethos and the, and the mindset that the church provides for us guess what happens enough people if if they see the light of Christ then they begin to want it and those who don't want it they leave and they leave under the pretense of like they would never say they don't want Christ. They always make it up with something like this person's that, you know, they ad hominem. But ultimately that is a thing where someone can actually, a community, a family can become holy. Like if you don't believe that, then what are you doing here? You know what I'm saying? And that that's the problem is that a lot of people, they don't believe that, you know? And, and unfortunately, this is kind of weird, I think circular in a sense, but they don't believe that because they've gotten jaded. But why do they get jaded? Well, they got jaded because they had these expectations that they didn't realize they had anyways. And so when their expectations, which is a Western thing, gets destroyed, now they're jaded. You see what I'm saying? And that's... <laughs> well, it's, it's because the Western value hierarchy was wrong from the beginning. From the beginning. So you're like, wait, this isn't matching up. Where's the, de- where's the democracy? Yeah. Where's the... And it's like, no, the democracy is the problem. Mm-hmm. If mm-hmm. democracy was so great, you wouldn't be here. Yeah. Like what? Well, if democracy was so great, you would just be worshiping at the altar of the state. And isn't that where we're headed? Isn't that what we're doing? And ultimately, yeah, and, un- until it all falls apart. <laughs> right. And and the thing is, what's funny is people go like, well, I'm just saying whatever. I've been in enough parishes at this point. You know, it's like everyone should not understand something. You know, I'm I'm almost 50. And I'm, it's not I'm almost 30. I'm almost 50. You know what I'm saying? Let's not get it twisted. You know what I mean? So, like, I'm just telling you, I've seen enough to be like, yeah, you know, when people follow a certain model and they think that that model is the way to be and it doesn't produce anything, it's like, well, of course it's not going to produce what you think it is, right? Because what your original intention isn't really about salvation it's about getting a nice well-oiled machine which again gets us back to the western thing you know what i'm saying so like i don't know i i just find it interesting because i guess getting back to your original question and what you're saying like for me these things and again i'm not the i'm not like anti-west you know it's like saint ambrose is one of my favorite saints you know and i'm i'm all about the fact that like I've said this before. I lean into the fact that I'm an American. Like, I think I'm the icon of the American. I could not exist outside of America. I could not exist outside of me being a Western man. So anyone at this point who, like, paused five minutes ago and just decided to go on a rant, just listen to this last. (laughs) Just listen to me right here saying, like, there was somebody. You know what I mean? I love the West. You know, just get to the end of the show before you get in the comments. But like, I, I just, I just think it's really important for us to kind of be aware of this. Why I don't, cause I think part of the problem is that this dialectic of like, I can't be Orthodox because it's just too weird and foreign. I just, I just can't buy that. And the reason why I can't buy that is because I sure I can maybe get some sympathy for you, but ultimately the problem is, is like, you were, why were you looking at orthodoxy in the first place? Right? Like, where's Christ? Because your current, the current system, well, hopefully, hopefully, I, I mean, I think for many people, and, and I guess we've heard this so many times, right? Is that it's like, what, what they're doing, what they have going on isn't working. And I think it's their first recognition that, They don't know it explicitly that like my value hierarchy is broken, but that's Mm -hmm. fundamentally what it is, is that like my value hierarchy is it's defective. The thing that I have put at the top is defective. And then inevitably, like what again happened with my with my friend. Christ is going to do some wild thing in your life that is going to make it to where you can't call it a coincidence. You can't call it any of these things. And you understand what is happening. There's some intelligence that is doing something right now, and it's all pointing at Christ, Mm -hmm. and it's all pointing at orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think so many people 
have, have had this experience now that it feels like old hat and I haven't even been around that long, but it, that I've heard so many of these stories. And I just heard one this last week to where I was like, whoa, that one's wild too. Mm-hmm. And, but I think that then there's that temptation. And I know it's, it was with me, with me a bit, but I was, you know, it was a great mercy that I was already outside of the value hierarchy I was used to in terms of the space that I was in when, when I approached orthodoxy. But I think that it is then going and looking for something familiar without all, without being fully conscious that like, no, the familiar things is the problem. Mm. It's 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 almost like if if someone is like it's I think it's like any addiction to something that's unhealthy for you, right? To where you're like, oh, you know, at least when I was like drinking all at least when I was smoking weed every day, man, that feeling of like, oh, I could just come home and smoke weed and chill and I could play video games and like now I don't have that same sort of just now I've now now I have levels of anxiety that I didn't have before. And it's like, no, 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 dude, but you're actually taking care of business now. Yeah, like, like like you actually have responsibilities. Like I, I think I think I want to kind of try to bring it home a little bit because I'm just kind of like thinking about like the last movement. Please, please. I just want to highlight some things. Like again, whatever's whatever. I, I don't care. I mean, you know, like we're not, it's not about trying to pretend you're something that you're not. Quite the opposite. But I think the thing is, is like like the couple we were talking with yesterday, um, the family and Andrew and I were talking at at, at coffee or whatever, and it's just like the husband brought up a great point. It's like comfortability. It's like, yeah, it's like comfortability. And so anyone can look for comfortability, whether they're Eastern, Western, Orthodox, Catholic, pagan, whatever. But like, let's just kind of zoom out a little bit. Let's just talk about like spirituality and just like finding God. Right. And like, that's the thing is like that, that desire, that would you call value hierarchy? Cyprian, as you said, like, yeah, value heart. Like what's, like, what's the highest good. And then what proceeds yeah, down from out of the, yeah, what like, cascades down? Like people, people have comfortability really high on their value hierarchy. I mean, let's let's take the Western part out. It's maybe the highest thing, Father. Yeah, it's maybe the highest thing. Yeah, and like let's just insert that. Let's just let's just let's because I think that loses some people because unfortunately this gets back to the identity thing because that's a whole other thing. Because well, let me just lay a little rabbit trail here because that's the problem with identity politics. And that's why, like, you know, it's, it's, there's these logies me that keep people like entrapped. There's these like structures and strongholds, like as Paul, St. Paul talks about strongholds in Corinthians that keep people captive and away from Christ. Identity politics is like one of the big ones, right? But like, the thing is, it's really easy for them to be like, identity politics you know, blacks and BLM or like whatever the thing is, but like, yo, <laughs> you got identity politics on the other side too. Like everyone has them and you have to like find yours, not find your neighbors. You need to find yours so you can break out of it. Cause you being able to point to the black guy and be like, man, you're so blinded by that. I mean, he is. But that's not helping you because you don't see that your whole identity politic is blinding you from Christ. And so that's the thing. You've, is, got, a, you've got a beam in your eye. you got a beam in your eye. And so yeah. w- why is that? Well, listen, right? Quote, it's not racist for me to be comfortable with my own. And it's not. I'm not. I'm just I'm just trying to say it for people explicitly so they can understand what I'm saying. Well, there's nothing wrong with me to be comfortable with my own people. No, of course. I, I get that. Just like, you know, I'm more comfortable with people who aren't cowards, who <laughs> like, you know, I don't, I, I'm more comfortable with people who are like willing to kind of like do violence to themselves for like a higher truth. Just that, that's just, you know what I mean? Because if you're not that, I get bored with you real quickly. I, I'm outed. I'm sorry. I'm a bad guy. Okay. That's the truth. So like, the thing is, is everyone has their biases and what they're comfortable with. The, the trick is, will you become comfortable in the right sense? Meaning you're comfortable with being uncomfortable. That's what happens when you become Orthodox. You just go like, instead of complaining all the time about how long the services is and this doesn't make sense and I can't find my rhythm. It's like, you begin to be like, you just learn to embrace it because you like, you realize I need to have all this shed shed off me and I want to, I'm going for the, I'm going for the gold. So anyways, back off of that little diatribe, like this whole thing about comfortability 
and having it as the highest value, I think, is really key because in the Gospels, this is called the world, the cares of the world, right? In the Gospels, this is like the rich young ruler, like all these things which become, which make us comfortable and make us familiar. It's like, these are the things that are idols. These are the things that constitute the flesh, right? Because the flesh isn't just about like, you know, the, the blood and the bone, right? All of these things need to be shed away. And that's why when you look at the ascetic tradition, the ascetic tradition isn't, is, you know, asceticism is the kind of manifest expression of what we're talking about here. It's kind of played out explicitly, but ultimately the, the spiritual movement of it is to now let go of those things that would lull us to sleep, right? I mean, and that comfortability, whatever, whether it's identity politics, like what all, what all the thing is, that's ultimately the problem. And it, and it comes in all shapes and forms, right? So it's like you shed one, don't pat yourself on the back and resting our laurels, what's the next one, right? Like, where are we going from here? Because the other side of it is it isn't just about pulling, like tearing yourself up for the sake of tearing yourself up. It's because don't you want to see Christ? Like, don't you, don't you want to encounter the light of God, right? And so these things get in the way of God. And more importantly, here's, here's the big, here's the big um, relief, which is you actually find yourself once you begin to lose these other things. Oh, like absolutely. Those things those things aren't you. Yeah. Right. And, and that's why like the tragedy of people not wanting to allow the change that's necessary to see God to happen. And I, I think that's, I think that's why if people think that, you know, again, orthodoxy, you know, that's a problem just seeing it as denominational. This and that. It's like, well, it's just a choice. And just like, it's just, you know, I, I just prefer a Western versus Eastern way of doing it. It's like, I see where people are coming from with that, but I think that there's something, and I think I know there's something deeper on a deeper level, getting back to like, what does it mean to be a fallen human being that has been for the most part, not, I can't say absolutely, but for the most part has been really lost, overlooked, buried, hidden, rejected in the West, just in our modern Western society those key things that will actually lead someone to a place of salvation are really, you know, and is it, is it intentional? I don't know. We can talk about that, but mm -hmm. I think that when you, when you begin to really do the digging that's necessary on yourself, what you're going to find is either your tradition is helping facilitate that or it's not. Helping facilitate discomfort crucifixion death. as a means mm. as a means i mean mm. i forgive me it's either it's either been in the epistles or the prologue or something i'm not a hundred percent with it but I've, there's been a like a thing about abraham being called out of his land like mm. recently and like mm. about how like i think it was in the epistles today where it's basically like by faith moses left egypt like mm -hmm. by faith Mm -hmm. um you know by faith like uh abraham was called out and i i'm not entirely sure what the timeline of of abraham was like when he left but like at a certain point he was called out of his homeland to go to like a land of foreigners right father yeah like, a land yeah. that wasn't his father's he didn't mm -hmm. know what, where he was going mm -hmm. so and i think he was pretty old at the time too he wasn't a young guy yeah yeah so immediately you're there's a call to leave what you know behind like immediately in the life of christ in the life of a christian in the life of a person who's following god you immediately have to leave the stuff that you know behind and like i mean and that's something that you know kind of does you know to play into something we we're talking about earlier christmas is like um yeah but it's so much more comfortable to use like western imagery to depict like the nativity and stuff like that but i was like but look what else is being said in the icon like like look what else is mm -hmm. like there's no old man whispering to joseph the betrothed in like yeah, exactly. activity like there's no like you know the, like if there is like a star shining down like it's like oh it's kind of like a hallmark nice like star that because you know stars have starlight and you know it's like no there's this whole like incredible meaning behind that and um 
Like it doesn't have the gra- it doesn't have gravitas, and you really miss like how difficult. Well, again, it's comfort and discomfort. Mm-hmm. Like you look at the icon and you see discomfort. You're like, whoa, this was hard for everybody involved. Yeah. Everybody involved here, it was very difficult. Everything that had to be done was really tough. And I just want to say this real quick, just to get everyone off off on the on the right foot. I'm not saying discomfort just for the sake of discomfort. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not it's not just oh, yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. It, this isn't shock rock. It isn't just kind of like, hey, let's you know what I mean? It's not being an edge lord. That's not that's not what we're talking about. But what we are talking about is something fundamental to salvation, right? Salvation, 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 salvation. Because like either either everything went down as the church says it did or it didn't. And if it went down as, as, as the way the church says it did, then obviously like what's been handed to us is the means it's God's economy of salvation. It's, it's how God has deemed it. And so what we look at is we see movements that divert us from that. Well, I think that more than waste, you know, more than kind of not necessarily wasting, but more than kind of like spending time on, the more kind of fine philosophical philosophical aspects of it, we can just kind of get down to like, how's it applied to your everyday life? It really boils down to understanding that this thing in you that wants to make everything comfortable, it's it can be really problematic, right? So does that mean that like, let me give you a great example, right? St. Justin Popovich, okay? St. Houston Popovich, right? Whatever. People are going to roll their eyes. That's fine. St. Houston Popovich, um, he... Who's rolling their stuff, eyes at St. Justin Popovich? I know. I, I just know how people are. Just listen to the story, and then you'll see why people roll their eyes. Uh, St. Houston Popovich, like one of his nuns, brought him some watermelon, right? And she was just like kind of curious, whatever, because she knew he loved watermelon. I don't even know what was in her mind, but she... Decided to kind of like peek in on St. Houston eating at this watermelon, right? And like she peeks in and he puts some ash from the sensor on the watermelon and begins to eat the watermelon, whatever. And she's like, oh my gosh. So she ends up and she's like, Father, why did you do that? Whatever. And he's just like, I love watermelon. <laughs> you know what I mean? And he's like, it shouldn't be sweeter than, than, than Christ. Mm. right so people can roll their eyes like okay whatever so now i can't and and i know people like this because they'll be like i can't enjoy anything then what are you saying father can't enjoy anything and i'm like well first of all that's why it's saint houston and not saint you fill in the blank (laughs) like there's no you know what i mean but i would say you don't need to not like not enjoy watermelon but the point is right this understanding of look Either this isn't our home and we're like trying to prepare ourselves to, to be able to get home or we're not, you know, it, it's like all these things that just become really easy to, to, to be like, that sounds cool in the middle of service, or that sounds cool when it's like ortho talk, but when no one else is looking or when I just kind of want to turn off and just be whatever, I don't want to hear about St. Houston. I want to hear about that stuff. It's like, that's part of the problem is a dichotomy of people want to turn it on and off when it's comfortable. You want to turn on being, you know, an ortho bro, ortho, whatever, when it's appropriate and you want to turn it off when it's not, that's the problem. The dichotomy of like, here's my life of like eating whatever I want, doing whatever I want when it's, you know, not seen by anyone. And here's, here's the vanity of people thinking that I'm Orthodox, whatever that means. Like these are, these are the problems. And all the, the reason why you would do that is because I'm, I can be uncomfortable here because this is acceptable in my friend group, my peer group. This is acceptable to how I see myself psychologically. Hmm. But over here, this is this is the thing no one shall touch. And like, hey, we all have them. I'm not saying mm-hmm. I don't. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I don't. Right. Um pfft. I'm known for having creamer on Wednesdays and Fridays. You know, I'll out myself, right? So, 
Easy, father. Easy. I know. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> right. So I'm just saying, like, these are the things that really are so practical and down to earth. Mm -hmm. And they're so simple, but they're so hard to do. Like, there's so many people who want to think that it's about debate and knowing very kind of like obscure esoteric aspects of orthodox theology mm -hmm. but it really really isn't it really is are you encountering christ now or not okay mm -hmm. if you're not encountering christ it probably is because you're doing what's comfortable for you and that's facilitating a further kind of like callous and darkening of your noose and like that's why right if you if you're not encountering christ here right talk to your spiritual father or whatever, you need to probably shock the system and your spiritual father will show you how to shock your system to get things kind of moving in the opposite direction. Cause that's what this life is for, right? Either someone believes this life is for repentance or they don't, you know what I mean? And how that plays out is different for everybody, right? Not everyone's going to put ash on their watermelon, right? But there's going to be something you need to do. There's going to be something that you need to allow to be uncomfortable. And that I think that that's baked into the system, right? It isn't about necessarily like what you know. It's more about like what you do and how you are, right? I don't know. No, I mean, it makes sense because then it's like, um, like St. Paisios did the same thing that when he got food that was really good, like say in like the cafeteria on Mount Athos, I don't know what that would be called. But like when it was something he actually liked, he'd pour water over it to like make it gross so that it would be all like mushy and stuff like <laughs> yeah. that. Like, it's just like, this is the kind of stuff that when you, it's why you need to read the lives of saints guys. Cause if you yeah, think for yeah. a second you're doing good, it's just like you read St. Paisios and like, yeah. I don't love anybody. Like yeah. I don't love anybody and I'm not willing to do anything that's uncomfortable. Like, like this guy would never go to sleep. without making sure his other, his brother monks, his chores were done. Like he wouldn't, and like even then, he's going to sleep in like a piece of wood for an hour. Like, yeah, like like I, I rock. like I I think the thing is is here's the thing. I'm going to say a blanket statement, and then I'm going to say you need to figure it out with your priest, right? But the Orthodox tradition without asceticism isn't the Orthodox tradition. I don't know how we got here, but I think maybe that's probably one of the distinctions, right? Is that asceticism is just baked into the tradition. And it's asceticism, not for the sake of asceticism. We've talked about this so much, but like I, I think that's one of the things to kind of really understand. That I think when people can't wrap their mind around stuff, it's like, yeah, you could talk about the aesthetic. I don't like the orthodox aesthetic. I like the Western aesthetic. Okay, well, why? Because I'm more comfortable. Why? Because I'm more familiar with it. But why? You know what I mean? Why? Why are you more familiar with it? Why is your society this way? Right? There's a reason. Well, you're you're institutionalized, right? It's like someone coming out of of doing a twenty year bit, and then they come out and they're like, "Oh, I don't feel comfortable except sleeping in a small hard bed. I don't feel comfortable except eating the same food that I ate when I was in prison." You know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. yeah, that's not good. Mm -hmm. That's not no, that's not good. You shouldn't be. Oh, I don't feel I don't feel comfortable unless I'm walking around completely swole because who knows who might you know shank me in the back and it's like dude nobody's gonna shank you in the back out here like that's not happening that's not happening now like you don't got to worry about that and it's that's that's where and it's also things... why it's tougher people forget exactly. well exactly sure it's tougher course. people because this is the thing it's like i say this and everyone's just like what are you talking about and it's like that's the problem is like there's no system there's no system except for like you need to be uncomfortable in a way that's going to facilitate your progress towards salvation. Because the guy who comes out who's like, I've been sleeping on the floor. I eat only one meal a day, blah, blah, blah. But he's comfortable with that. That's not you. You having poverty and discomfort isn't valuable in of itself. And I think that's what people don't understand in these conversations. I'm not saying it's valuable in of itself because you're not David Goggins. You're not trying to Goggins them. <laughs> I trust that's really funny. He's coming for you, man. He's... 
<laughs> I know. I don't know why I keep going in on Goggins, but I don't want to see. I don't want to see. Him. I certainly wouldn't want to see him in one-on-one -on -one combat. Except the He's first gonna... thing I do is attack his knees. I'm going straight for those non-existent knees of his. Oh, I know. <laughs> and his ankles. <laughs> You're gonna be out there at the beach one day. You're gonna I know. Pod, you're gonna see a pontoon boat, <laughs> and then you're gonna see this guy. He's, just, he's swimming. He's swimming. He's I'm swimming. You. I, I don't know what you're talking about, me. And he's gonna grab some coconuts. And just, yeah, just he's gonna start throwing throwing coconuts. <laughs> I know, I know. I'm sorry, David. I'm sorry. I'm tired of you talking about me. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. I trust that's all very funny. Suffering for, suffering for the sake of suffering. That's where we were. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think that that's, that's like, I think we're, that's where, like, um, that's at least where I go to die. Is because it's just like, when it becomes about the thing, and like, that's because... I mean, it's really easy to fall into that trap. It's like, I mean, I'm in a period in my life right now where I'm not really like getting to sleep a lot and that's okay. Like, I mean, it's, I've realized, like, I think, I think most people probably actually, it's different for everyone, but probably sleep a little bit too much, especially in America. Um, because I can only talk about America, but it's like, I know for a fact that like, this is not because of, I'm not doing this for Christ. Like, I'd like to think I am. But like, this is just a purely like a thing of circumstance right now. So it's not like, you know, it's like what Father Kuzmas has said before. It's like, I by nature am not a terribly, I am, but not a terribly angry person. So it's not really going to be, not going to help me out a lot come judgment day. It's like, no, you weren't really that angry in the first place. So you not getting angry wasn't really that big of a deal. Like, but my wife who does struggle a little bit more with anger that is going to be a big deal for her the times that she did actually like really have to work through some anger and like really have to like walk through that fire and come out the other side like that's the, that's what's really going to hold up so it's like okay yeah it's really easy to get especially you know we're at the tail end of a fast in the middle of the fast, you just get really used to saying no to cheeseburgers and hostess cakes and soda or whatever. But it's like it becomes really difficult to remember, like, why I'm doing that? Like, why am I doing this? Other than it's just like it's become long enough where it's kind of like a pattern for me where I just like, no, this is just not that time in my life right now where I just say. So I've kind of already like lost the point of the fast. It's like, no, I'm not suffering for anything in particular. I'm not giving up anything in particular. It's just like kind of cultural at this point. So like, you know, I mean, I would have to work against that. I have to say like, no, because there's a difference between shutting down just a temptation and like allowing yourself to like pray through it, I think is what I'm trying to say is like, it's really easy to just be like, no cosmic brownies, like, nope. And it's just like, no, I'm not going to do it. Instead of like allowing like to be like, okay, no, I really want this. God, please help me. Like, you know, by my own will versus, you know, God actually helping me, I think is what I'm trying to say, because it's at a certain point, it's like, well, what am I even fasting for? I'm fasting. I'm not fasting for God um, because it's become ingrained in me. Like, it's like, no, you're fasting just to fast. And like, that requires like a reorientation of like, okay, well, why are you doing this? And it's like, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just doing it to do it. And it doesn't the really obscuring The obscuring of the why seems to be the grand demonic movement of our time. Like, it, it makes me think about... Um, like I, I and I've, I've said here, like I still check in on the bodybuilding community and stuff because I was like I, I was a part of it. And so I still and I, I mean, I still go and lift and I'm losing muscle as the days go by. But like maintaining, you know what I mean? I can't I'm, I'm never going to be like what I was, but I, I go in and I work and I pay attention, especially young guys. But what I'm seeing now is more than ever, it seems like there is a movement among young men to get in the gym, but to get ridiculously big, bigger than I've ever seen. Uh, and, th and there are people where, and, and the things that I'm seeing, the narrative that I'm seeing about it is like a complete loss of why, like a complete loss that it's just like, no, just go into the gym, get big, getting big is the thing to do maybe to show it off or whatever. But the, the, there's so many people showing it off that the narrative is just like, just go and do it. And and watching that it's like 
yeah, you know, when I was coming up, it was about training for for sports, whatever, whether that whether there was a prideful and vain aspect to it, or at least training to be in a bodybuilding show, which there's a ton of vanity and look at look at those guys now and they can't even walk. But at least there was a why an acknowledged why. I feel like it's almost more demonic that it's like, oh, there is no why, even though there is a why. But you're just being it, like it's being what am I trying to say? It's being purposely obscured. You're doing it for a why, but you're almost being told and telling yourself that there is no why. There's only a what. If that I think sense. that I think I think you're on to it in the sense that because the why comes from the heart, you know, like right. if we look at the three parts of the soul. Right. So the intellect, the will, the heart, the, you know, the the intellect the is the what. Right. The the will is the how and the heart is the why. And, you know, again, it's it's these gross, boiled down kind of like um, comparisons. But really, orthodoxy is about the heart, you know, like why? Why are you doing something? You know, who are you doing it for? Right. Versus everything else is like the kind of like the, the, the how and the what, you know, like. I think when you begin to understand that that obscuring happens in our tradition primarily around people trying to um achieve something right because i i've seen this before it's like I, I can't remember i saw this so if if you did this and you and forgive me so basically i'm, I'm gonna quote something i saw i can't remember who did it and if it, it's someone i know i apologize i'm not trying to throw shade at you but i'm just kind of highlighting something but like I feel like I saw something not too long ago about like, you know, why do men like orthodoxy, whatever. That might have been someone I know. No problem. I get it. Whatever. But like, I think that kind of gets into the realm of like, well, I didn't watch whatever. I didn't read whatever. I just remember seeing that as a tagline. And it's fairly easy to assume that, you know, um, there's a challenge. And then, you know, I've seen these memes before. Orthodoxy, it's like, Christianity, but tougher, and the, like the Orthodox Green Beret, and like all that's fine and good. Like, okay, I get that on a little spiritual level. athletes calling the monks spiritual athletes. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah. Great, great, that's great. You know, not it's not that it's not true, right? Clearly, it's totally true. It's totally true, and that's good if it gets you in the door. But I think the thing that we're trying to get at is that, like, this is the problem: is that it can become easy for people to kind of get ups- to look. I spent a lot of time like being like, hey, that's great. I'm glad you're here because of X, Y, and Z. But just so you know, I'm going to rip that away from you. I just, you know what I mean? If you're here, like the whole thing, if you're here to run from the wokes, I'm going to rip that away from you. If you're here to like run away from Rome, I'm going to rip that away from you. Because even in that, you know what I mean? I'm going to shove Ambrose down your throat. You know what I mean? In Augustine, right? Like whatever the thing is, if it if it's obscuring the why and the who, which is what's the why? My salvation. What is salvation? Right. Salvation is me being returned to the original intention that God always had, which is to be imbued and united with him in, in my personhood, right? Like mm-hmm. to be made like God, to be united with him. Like that's that's salvation, right? And that salvation is always about a a, a who. Because without the who, then we're falling into like weird Hinduism and like self deification and like self, you know, David Goggins, all that stuff. That's why like there's people where I'm like, that's cool. You're doing all this stuff and it has an orthodox veneer. But like, is it is it unto salvation or is it unto you being a bigger, badder dude that can handle whatever Chai Com is coming through and whatever? Well, you know what I'm saying? Like, if that's what this is about, it's like that's not salvation either. Right. And this is this is why it's tough, because. From glory to glory, if we if you aren't actively looking for those things to offer to God in regards of your repentance, in regards of your your flesh, then something then then you're then you're not there. Does that make sense? Like for you to say. It's good and people do this. I got baptized. That's it. And they and it's coast time, whatever. You know what I mean? Or like, I got made a reader, or I got ordained, or whatever your thing is that you did it, and like, okay, I'm good. And that happens to people. 
I'm just saying, like, no matter what your level is, like, I want to be a monk. I'm a monk now. Like, whatever it is. I want to get married. This happens all the time. I want to get married, right? You get the girl, and then boom, you don't care anymore. Or really often, you know, I want to get married. You get the guy, you let yourself go, whatever. Boom. It's like, okay. Like, this is what I'm talking about, you know, because it's we're not static. And the whole situation isn't static. And so if you think that it's about, let me get the system, let me get the numbers, let me get the method, right? And let me just get dialed in. It's all good. It's like, that's super dangerous, right? Because at that point, you don't understand eternal life, right? And as far as it's possible, I don't understand it either, right? But I understand it in this sense. I know that I'm not going to attain it here in its fullness. I know that like, I'm still breathing. So that means I still got work to do. You know what I mean? Like that. And 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 then you begin to live your life out like that. It isn't kind of like, eh, you know, that was kind of a good run. But I think that's part of the problem with the fasting cycles for people is that it's like, you know, I'm in it. But then on the normal days when it's in between, it's just kind of like you 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 throw that all out the window and it's like, no, you know, like, and again, part of being a Christian is being thankful and, and learning to love God and learning to enjoy the things of God. But again, Andrew talked about sleep and it's like, I'm just going to tell you a little secret. The less you sleep, the better you do. And, and on a real sense. Yeah, that's wild how true that is. It's just true. It's just true. Right. And it's the same thing. Like the less that you eat, the better that you do. That's just true. Like gluttony isn't good for you. And it, and and gluttons don't really enjoy food the way that someone who's fairly austere does. You ever had I, you ever, father father forgive me. I also on that note of sleeping and eating, what I've been thinking of what I've been thinking about lately is it's it is interesting this relationship between like doing good because when I'm really when I'm really on it in terms of like I'm energized about the work that I'm doing and I know that the work that I'm doing is meaningful. I see and I know that it's helping people. I'm less hungry throughout the day yeah. and I need less sleep. Yeah. Like that's the crazy part. The harder I'm working, which, mm -hmm. which seems counterintuitive, mm -hmm. but it's like the harder I'm working, the less food and the less, so long as the work that I'm doing, I know is a benefit. Mm -hmm. Like that I really down to my core, know that what I am doing is making things better. I can work so hard and I need less sleep and less food. But when it's like when I'm when I'm in moments when I'm have an unsureness about what is it that I'm supposed to be doing and all of this, it seems that I'm more tired yeah. and hungrier. Yeah. It's so yeah. it should be it's so counterintuitive. It should be the reverse, right? You would think. And, and isn't that one of those things? Like for me, I don't know, this could be boring for a lot of people because they could feel like this is stuff we're always talking about. But for me, I think these are the conversations that I found really profound because the whole like, you know, kind of esoteric, it's way out there. Like, again, I need to read some sort of something. I don't understand half of what he's saying. It's like, you don't need that. You need to really hear what we're trying to say about like these weird like inversions that happen because that's entering into the spiritual life. Like for instance, so I'm working on, um, I was listening to the life of St. Mary of Egypt a couple on a uh, Saturday night. And um, it was like two hours. Like I'm just like had it on repeat. And I was just like, man, it's just, it's crazy. Right. Because someone could say like, oh, okay, whatever, you know, how she do that. But I started thinking, I'm like, okay, there's so many parts in there about, how there's this like regenerative first of all repentance is regeneration and so you get into the machine and it almost becomes like a dynamo like once it's activated the propulsion begins to propel itself does that it, you, yeah. you see what i'm saying yeah 100 percent. yes so yes. it's like someone's like well how okay well listen when you understand the level of debauchery that she's talking about Right. When you understand that and you understand that, you know, there's all these things that are in play there. Just just do this. Right. And I know this is true. I know from experience. Right. This part right here. 
So I go, how did she do this? Like, I would go crazy, right? But I'm like, okay, think about it this way. She had a rough, she's just, oh my gosh, why am I here? Falls asleep. She talks about how she would often fall asleep, just like lamenting, whatever. And then you would wake up, you're in the desert, it's cold, you're naked, you're hearing wolves, on top of just like remembering these crazy demonic experiences you just had, right? And then it would just be like this. Why am I here? Just she would cut like because that's the thing coming to yourself. It's like the prodigal son, right? Remember what it says in the prodigal son? It says that he came to himself and then he returned to his father's house. So St. Mary of Egypt had this perpetual coming to herself. What am I doing here? Oh, that's right. Do you see what I'm saying? And then she remembers all these other things, including the mother of God coming to her, including the mother of God, allowing her to come into the church, including, you see what I'm saying? And then the energy begins again. And then how she's now able to make it through another day. That coming to yourself becomes a way of being. And that way of being is theosis. Like that way of being, of being aware of the true repentance that she was needing to live out, Right. That began to that began to fuel her, and so every time she would run out, it's just like I'm undone. I think I'm going to die now, right? Here we go again. You wake up, boom, and then you just remember. So getting back to our kind of early part of our conversation about remembrance and memories, and there's a reason why memories and implanting false understanding of what memory is and how it works is a part of the plan or the game because the memory is so powerful. What is Deuteronomy? Deuteronomy is the book of remembrance, right? Like there's these aspects, there's a whole part of the liturgy and that's, that's the remembrance, right? All of these things, right? They kickstart these very profound and noetic and spiritual, you know, excuse me, that is redundant. These noetic, and incarnational movements, the spiritual and the bodily aspect, the whole being that begins to now taste the life of God. And that's eternal life. And that's that's where you can begin to start having some confidence. You know, this thing about evangelicals and stuff, they'll come in, they're just like, where's, where's my assurance of salvation? It's like, well, what happens is there is no assurance of salvation in regards of you looking for some some, some neat doctrine that kind of like says, well, I plugged in these numbers and I'm good. Where you do begin to have that is when you begin to work in this cycle of repentance and it begins to regenerate you, then you begin to touch and to taste the life of God. And the life of God allows you to do the impossible. That that's You may not be in the desert like St. Mary of Egypt, but hey, maybe you can look back and say, I was once a fornicator. I was once a sodomite. I was once a whatever. And I haven't done that since my baptism. That, that is your 47 years in the desert. Well, and that's, the, that's, a, that's a true, that's the only way that I think as human beings that we can have an assurance of anything is that we're, we say, I, I mean, it's, it's like with your kids, you say it to your kids that it's like, look, they're, they're worried about something coming up and their time spans are short because their lives are so small. And then it's like, oh, I don't know if I could do this. And it's like, you draw back to something. Well, remember, there was a time when you didn't know your ABCs. Mm -hmm. You know that you know them now, right? No problem. And it's like, look, you were you were able to learn your ABCs. So that means that it's you have the power. It's in you. You could do it. You know what I mean? And I think that we need those. We need those exactly like you said, like, that's the assurance that it's like, look, Christ gave you this. Do you think that's all he has? That's all he has to give, yeah. right? That it's like obviously there's there's more. How much more? Well, all of it, if you're willing to go. Like if you're willing to go there. And that's the problem with the comfortability is that I think if you if your bar is so low that you being comfortable is the me is the is the measure and the means by which you know God. It's like, man, you're you don't even you don't know who God is. Right. But but what is comfort anyway? Like, is it as as somebody who lived a period of my life when I had like more money that I could than I could spend, 
completely cushy life and no real need for any sort of responsibility and at the same time being praised so no like external like enemies or anything or worrying about oh somebody gonna break in my house and do something because i had done it in a criminal manner that was the least comfortable i ever had i ever was like spiritually and emotionally and i know it was the least comfortable because i was constantly self-medicating if it was so good i wouldn't have thrown myself into uh, self-medicated with every vice possible and so it's like, where is the comfort anyway? This thing that people are are chasing after for comfort, it's like you're not going to get it. Right, right. Which is the great tragedy and irony maybe, right? Is that maybe it's we should... The re- only ma- it's not the only machine that's perpetual. Because I mean, like, like whereas the other one is uh, brings you to repentance, I know what it's like to chase comfort. And like that is a perpetual motion machine as well. I mean, you just, all you have to do is just keep moving the carrot a little bit farther back, you know, and like you just are willing to go to sink to lower and lower depths in order to find it. So, I mean, it's just an inversion, right? Or it's like a, just a, a um, bastardization, I guess, maybe is the right term of repentance of like this, like need to like continuing to push yourself and like, you know, not because I think St. Porphyrios or someone says like, when you're getting ready to pray, because, you know, we're, we're not in favor of images, like, of like, as far as like, um, images in our mind while we pray or something, you know, but like, he says, you know, call the mind like a peaceful field, you know, or like a very particular, like pretty, like, you know, I think maybe like piece of music or something like that, like something that makes you think of like the divine for a minute, because that's that remembrance is like, is like, okay, that's my little feel to keep going. That's my like little, like, little like drop in the gas tank and then the opposite is true i mean the opposite is true where it's like okay no i mean i'm beginning to sense that uncomfort is coming soon what do i do in order to avoid that and like that's where the whole like self-care you know it's like the minute something becomes uncomfortable you've earned this you know like and as much as like i was a fan of this show back in the day um Parks and Rec. It's a show I really liked back in the day. I, I haven't watched it in years and years, but there's this episode where they do this, like, treat yourself. Like, this episode where it's like, you want to get that coat? Treat yourself. And, like, that became a cultural touchstone of, like, this idea of, like, no, you deserve it. You do it. Like, it's okay to, like, treat yourself this one time. And that's, like, the opposite. I mean, it's, like, it's the anti-repentance. It's, like, no, I don't need this. I just need to... I need to work on me and I need to focus on me for a little bit. So, I mean, it it is interesting that like in the cultural lexicon in the West right now is that like, oh, there's this there's a there's a massive drug epidemic and it's like, oh, it's fentanyl, it's opioids. But it's like, I think that there's there's a like a historical gap because, I mean, opium has been around for a long time and it always has like the opium den. Well, Mm. what's the opium den? It's exactly it's where you go to be comfortable. It's mm-hmm. like it's the most comfortable. It's set up perfectly. It's couches where you I mean, it's a, even a drug. If you smoke an opium, you smoke it laying down with a long <laughs> pipe and a, and a and being waited on by a little Chinese woman. You know what I mean? With, with the, the, the lilting little sitar in the background and the, so, some, some uh, you know, nice potpourri smelling stuff. And it's just like. Yeah, the really what everybody's cha- people are like, oh, it's a drug problem. It's a drug problem. It's a drug problem. It's not a drug problem. Like drugs are just one. Yeah. Like they're the most obvious way. But it's like th- to me, I don't think there's a difference b- between the drug problem and the porn problem. No. Oh, no, no, no. Like they're the same problem. And it's and it's exactly like you said, Andrew, is that it's like, oh, there's discomfort coming. Oh, there's discomfort coming. Oh, let me go immediately in a prophylactic way let me like before it hits me before any discomfort hits me let me get comfortably comfortably numb that's what it is let me go get comfortably numb yep yep cheeseburgers whatever you name it you name it Uh, video games whatever which is that's the whole thing about when we're talking about heaven banning and stuff last year and just like exactly you know just being comfortable like that that's so demonic that's so demonic it's like the real that's where it gets like ooh eerie and creepy and really evil 
is like that's that's the getting in the gate. And then once you're in the gate, that's when the hatred comes out. That's when the assault and the brutality, the darkness, the viciousness. But that's once that's that's once they got you. Like, here's a little thought. Unless you're on the other side and you're you're working, that's great. But if you're experiencing the the uncomfortable aspects of, of evil, right? It's one of two things. You're it's never too late, but you're kind of like in a real bad shape because you they're already in the door. They've already kind of closed the door on you. Or I understand any other way it, it applies, God's calling you to like fight, to like wake up because you've been comfortable. Does that make sense? So he's allowed that comfortability to kind of like that veil to be pulled off of you to realize where you're really at because that's how they get you in is, is to be comfortable and to fall asleep. That's the thing, you know? Mm. 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 I mean, yeah, I don't, yeah, it's, that's, I could go on, but I don't want to because, you know, it, it is, it's the, it's like the Cyprian's right. And I tell that to people a lot when I'm counseling and it's like, you know, drugs are just the most evident form of what's happening. The problem is, is that like, um, you know, it, it's like, and I, I've said this before um, to people and it's gotten different reactions, including from some of the people from like, you know, the gay community themselves. I'm like, really the alphabet soup stuff, whatever. This is like a first world problem. It's the problem because everyone's so comfortable. It's like whatever, like there's like well, and we feel entitled to that comfort. Well, yeah, and and now that's <clears throat> it's a really popular thought. Is like you deserve. I mean, okay, like okay, it is what it is. But like, I mean, like what the 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 um oh reaction. The reaction is part of the spell. But them raising the minimum wage in California to twenty dollars an hour, right? It's like, okay, well, I'm entitled to this money. I, I, you know, I fill out the application, I turn it in, I did a ten minute interview. I deserve to get paid twenty dollars an hour, and it's like, people are funny. And, I mean, I don't know what twenty dollars an hour looks like out in California. It's probably not nearly as much as it looks like here in the midwest yeah but the reason why is because they've kept raising the minimum wage that's the thing you keep raising the minimum wage and the prices of everything necessarily goes up that's I just think simple that's, economics i think that's the theory and i i would be inclined to agree with it if somebody wants to clackety clack and be like okay no that's actually not true and we don't know whatever whatever mm -hmm. it seems to me the more readily available money is the less it's worth but i mean well, who am i you know i'm you know i'm barely literate but the point is, is that like when people are like, there's these signs, you know, the signs, it's like stop Asian hate, you know, whatever, whatever. One of the signs is like, I deserve to be taken care of. I deserve this money. I deserve to be able to feed my family off of my Pizza Hut job or whatever. And it's like, okay, sure, I guess I would disagree there first off, but like, um, not because you're a bad person or because you're evil, but it's like, again, you did what to get this job? It's like, you know, like you fill out an application is that through a 10 minute interview and you passed a drug test. No, you don't, you don't, nobody drug tests the jobs anymore, like at those jobs anymore. So no, you in whatever, whatever. It's like, no, I'm entitled to this. And when that entitlement comes into play, it's like, it's never like, what I try and tell people is, is like, that there's no opposite feeling to how you feel with that. If you feel this entitlement, there is no satisfaction for you. It's the minute you get the thing that you want. And we've seen it with the progression of, and I just talked with father about this, like this was part of that conversation is like, you know, I'm just realizing more and more the left is not the problem. They're ridiculous. It's clown shoes, but it's like, they're not the problem, but you've seen a lot with the woke. It's like, they get their little victory. And it's the next thing. It's automatically like move on to the next thing and you move on to the next thing. So it's like this entitled feeling that you have. Once you get the thing, it's either like, well, why didn't I have this all along? Or what's the next thing I'm entitled to? And then like all of it is really just to be able to be like, okay, I'm done. I've got my life set up. Now I can sit back and relax. It's like, well, fool, tonight your soul will be required of you. Like you've spent your entire life 
stocking up to build your little utopia, your little micro utopia. And once you got it, like one, you're going to be miserable in it in the first place. And two, like you've wasted your life chasing this thing that doesn't mean anything. So it's like this entitlement has led you ultimately to this greater spiritual death. And well, that's it's the it's the it's the what we were talking about, about the presence under the Christmas tree that it's like you think, right? The kid thinks, oh, what? those presents under the Christmas tree. Once I get at those presents under the Christmas tree, it's going to be, but once they're done, oh, it's like, well, where's the next present to open? I know. I, t- I was telling my 17 year old daughter about that. Um, and, you know, we've, 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 we've really been talking a lot and I, I've talked, I kind of like, I don't think I introduced her, but I've really like, it's now a lot more in her vernacular, this idea of like, no, my children who are living with me, they can have too much fun. It's like to the point oh, where yeah, like, you can have too much fun there starts to be like major behavioral issues, which mm-hmm. are of course indicative of a sick spiritual but condition. The, but the problem is, is that that's like, why is that a revolutionary thought? Like that's part of the problem. Right. That, right. You know what <laughs> I mean? Like, like, of course you can have like too much fun. Like not, not, mm-hmm. not you, but just in general, like, I mean that I, I've told the story before, but I, I'll never forget. It's like, I remember I was, gosh, I was working at, at at the old shop and this is years ago man years ago like 20 years ago right and i remember 20 plus 20 years ago what am i talking about like good lord 20 and anyways i remember telling someone about i don't even know i was talking to this joker but somehow it came up and i was explaining that i i was disciplining my son right this is like my oldest son when he was a kid he was like four at the time and this guy literally got all like proto like you know proto millennial woke on me and got upset that I was like you discipline your kid what kind of father are you <laughs> I was I looked around and said is this is this for real no that's a true story a better dad real? than your dad like, like yeah how like there's that's 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 that. funny it's like oh you 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 cook food? What kind of chef are you? Yeah. Like, yeah. What 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 yeah. is the job of a father besides you know I mean? disciplining their like, child? Like, guy, is there a, a different job? I mean, I mean, <laughs> he had to have been at least eighteen years old because you got to be eighteen to get tattooed. It's like, what do you do? This kid's like, but literally, he was old enough to try to talk to me like a man and be like, and of course, you know, I guess this, you know, discipline and definitions of it, but it's like that's the problem is that. We th- we have this whole narrative about like pleasure and good and and all this stuff, man. And it it's it that's demonic. That structure of thinking and and the way that things have been orientated because it kills people. It I mean it's on like it's that when because Cyprian and I were talking about that before you jumped on the call, Father. At the end of the day, the kid gets eight presents or whatever. They tear through them. Da, 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 da. What's next? What's next? What's next? What's next? And when there's nothing there, they just like they, they flip out. There's like there's like okay, well, what's next? What's the next thing that we do? What's it's like there is no yeah, next but thing. also too. Let's just take this. Let's just take this in mind too, because there's someone who's you know, well, it's our fault, right? Because we're giving them eight presents because well, we want to live vicariously. That's- that's you know what the I mean? end of the thought is like, who's this really for? Yeah. It's for the grandparents and the parents to sit back and be like, we did a good job. We got them everything it's we pride. wanted. And it's I can't, pride. I don't want to watch them suffer and like, yeah. oh, well, how come I didn't get the whole set of the Power Rangers? How come I only got mm-hmm. like the three? Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, you got to make sure and get the whole set because he wants the whole set. We got to make sure that we get the PS5 this year. Can we just get him? One? No, that was the PS4. He needs the PS5 right. now right. because that's what all his friends have. And it's like, and, but my 17 year old daughter saw it for the first time. She saw it with her younger siblings that she's living with that they immediately were at each other's throats. Like, as soon as the presents were open, they were like, no, this one's mine, no, this one's... And it's like, you know, you need to share. It's like, and it's like, and she, like, had to, like, get in there and, like, like separate them. It's like, this is the problem. And, like, I mean, even now, let's say, like, I'm right in the middle of, like, a tough situation or something, I, like, watch a clip from a movie or something like that on YouTube real quick. I don't know, whatever. I immediately, like, the cogs start turning my head. It's like, oh, this is forever. Like the dopamine that's being dropped in my right. like I'm watching the fight scene from right. Batman versus Superman where Batman's in the warehouse and he beats the crap out of everyone. It's like it's always a club mm-hmm. banger. But it's like 
I know, like immediately like, I have to come back to reality and be like, oh, wait, I still have to go do this thing. Like I, I forgot about that, like for a minute. And like, that's almost harder to like come back and be like, oh, the coming to the coming to yourself, the right? coming to myself, which is Yeah. that way I wanted to like tie, tie it all together Mm is that that coming to myself of being like, no, there's still work to be done. And like in I think like in Blade Runner 2049 or something like that, he's getting rid of Merca. Merca uh, uh, synthetic. I can't remember what they call him in that movie or whatever. He's getting ready to kill uh, an android or whatever. And he's like, I don't eat food until the hard work of the day is done. Like, he's like, can I get you some food? Because they're all doing this like dance back and forth. He's like, can I get you some food? He's like, I prefer not to eat until the hard work of the day is done. And it's like, I can see what's happening because it's like this whole like, no, I don't want to set up this expectation of like, it's almost easier for me to just kind of stay down until like maybe I can take a little bit of rest at the end of the day than to like kind of have this distraction of being able to like, Oh, I'm going to step outside here and like shut off the struggle. I'm going to like shut it off for a little bit. And this way of like, you know, sectioning and putting my life into different parts. So anyway, Well, you can't you can't prey on a full stomach, Nope. but it's just objectively true. But like I've there's so many things like I, I also can't write on a full stomach. It's like I've written multiple books, but like t today I started in on 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 a new writing project. But it was one of the things that I was like, so got up, prayed, did the gym, came back and I was about to go and start making breakfast. And then I was like, oh, no, if I make this breakfast. There's no way I'm going to get any writing. I I'm not going to be able to get in and get this writing done. It's like when would any productive human being and don't I'm not actually throwing shade because I eat them too. When would you ever eat pancakes? Like I can't think of a time Dude. when you should ever If eat you oh my if gosh. you if you purposely if you purposely do not want to do anything that day, if you need to prevent yourself from doing work that Oh day, my gosh. eat pancakes. <laughs> Oh my I god. eat pancakes for breakfast. I'm done. I'm done by like, let alone the sugar crash I'm going to have Mm -hmm. come like 10, 30, 11 o'clock where I'm coming down from the coffee and the pancakes. But like, I'm just going to feel like garbage. Well, you you know, I mean, you know what they're, I mean, you think about what that food was created for. That food was created for cowboys. Yeah. Like the idea was you were going to have this one meal early in the day that was going to load you with carbs. And then you, right after that meal and like half a thing of coffee, you're about to go and like get on a horse and drag, you know, cows after you as you're out on the range. That's the only person who should be eating pancakes. That's it. <laughs> Yeah. Well, looks like I need to make some changes to my lifestyle. I haven't had pancakes in a, quite a long time. It's one of the ways that the um, there was a temptation during a fast. I don't know why. I always there's always certain foods that hit me. I don't want them when I'm not fasting. I'm like I don't really want this thing. It's it'd be great, sure, but I'm not going to go on my way to pursue it. But when I'm fasting, I'm like pancakes, man, that sounds good. Like I would crush some pancakes, right? But it's like. You might you might be able to do you might be able to do fastable pancakes. You could probably do it like Oh yeah, maybe yeah, on no, an no, oil no, no, on an oil allowed day, no, no, maybe no, no, no. There, no. yeah, the body has got a Yeah, sort exactly. of, you know, Of course you can. But yeah, I no, mean, it's just I don't eat them. Man. It's... yeah, no, I mean, I mean, you can, and, and like honestly, that's probably your best bet because my wife also does banana pancakes, where like the central ingredient is just pretty much mushed up banana with a binding Yeah. agent and Yeah. and a little bit of like brown sugar, and it's like okay, this is fantastic. Like these are really good, and I don't feel like garbage afterwards. And that's the that's you know. Like in your spirit of like, I can't ride on an empty stomach or I can't ride on a full stomach. I mean, my baptizing priest, Father James, uh, I, I just, he's always talking about, he's like, I mean, you look at the dog. He had a dog, Mickey. He talked a lot about his dog, Mickey. He's like, Mickey, he, he you know, he's like all happy and cheery and happy to see you. He, you know, you feed him, then he eats and he's just a log laying on the ground. Just like, he's like, Mm you can't pray on a full stomach. Like, this is not, but like. It's also like it's really weird to eat food sometimes and not feel like crap afterwards. It's like and that's like an American like an experience. I guess. I don't know. It seems like it's like, OK, now that I'm not eating whatever, like this food, whatever, like two times a day, like it's weird to like eat food afterwards and be like energized and be like, oh, I had like whatever fast friendly food that, that I had that day or whatever, like a vegetable soup or whatever. And be like, oh, my gosh, like, no, I actually feel OK. Like, I don't feel like 
well, here's the rest of my day, you know, like I'm going to eat this gigantic steak burrito for lunch or whatever. Like, mm -hmm. you know, I love a giant steak burrito and, you know, <laughs> I think father and I have talked about our giant loves for or our loves for giant steak burritos, but Put it's a little ash on that watermelon. Yeah, I mean, that's it right there. <laughs> put a little ash on that watermelon. You're good to go. <laughs> I got to think of a way to maybe start making that a little bit more applicable. Because like uh -huh. if if you could, and I don't know how salvific this is, but if you could, and I'm sure that there is, and I don't want to hear about it. I'm just saying, <laughs> theoretically, if there's like a meal replacement pill where you could just take and it's like it would fill you up. And give you all the nutrients that you would theoretically need for like a 35 year old male i mean the coffee yeah. <laughs> oh no. oh don't double down <laughs> is that your don't double down mug <laughs> don't double down andrew <laughs> i'm don't just saying <laughs> i'm just saying i would be down for it every once in a while i would i'd be double down for it yeah but <laughs> I think it's a good place to call it, gentlemen. I mean, we're about at two hours. It's about two hours. Um, so anyway, um, so I'm going to mention it again because I think it's still applicable. We are still uh, looking if uh, we're still in the middle of a fundraiser for the school that's associated with our parish, um, the Mount Tabor School of Liberal Arts uh, out in Kansas City, Missouri. Um link in the description i yeah, think all, yeah. all all links in the description check out if you haven't watched the the video it's great the links in the description uh, yeah for the video as well yeah it's um it, it's it's a uh, it's absolutely incredible i i wholeheartedly wholeheartedly believe in what they not me because i'm not really involved right now but what they are doing in that school right now like it's incredible it's incredible the things that i you know talking with some of the teens who go there the stuff they're learning. I'm just like, man. And I tell, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Father Turbo's son, I talk with him quite a bit. Like, you go to the best school, man. He's like, I know. Like, I know I do. Like, it's like, it's not even like a up for debate. Like, he's like, I know. I know it's great. It's like, it's fantastic. And so, um, please. And, you know, also, if you are interested at all in how he's doing it, Adam Lockridge is a great you know, if you're wanting to start your own thing, if you're looking like, how do we do this? Like, don't want to do public school. I'm not sure how to do homeschool. I think we should do more of a community, blah, blah, blah. There it is. Uh, he's a fantastic resource. Um, uh, so actually, just a couple hours ago, a person who's been reaching out to me made a Royal Path podcast playlist on Apple Music, too. Oh. So, um, yeah, so it's on Spotify and on Apple Music. So there you go, guys. Um, and uh, I turned it on. And it was like the first three songs. The first song was like the Smiths. And then it was like um, Beastie Boys or something. And then it was like another artist I love. I can't remember who it was. But I was just like, well, I love this playlist. I think it's great. Like, I, you know, I don't check it out as much as I should. But it's the only place you'll listen to Celine Dion and Death Grips and then Kenny Rogers and then like the Peanut soundtrack all in like one, you know, most likely. Um, so check that out. Also, we have merch at royalpath.store. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody reached out and sent four shirt designs. I can't oh. find the email now. I sent oh, them no. to you guys. You guys have seen them. We need the original. Have I? Yeah. Remember, okay. it was the one with like, thank you for having a good night. And oh, then, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We need the high res version. We, we need, need the high res versions because we would like to make those maybe happen. Like we sure. would we'd like to at least explore the idea. So if you're listening, please send us the originals. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Um and well, we don't see any of that money from that merch store. Uh, you know, it either goes to the people, to the parish, or to the people who um, create the stuff. Uh, also, oh my gosh, Jack, is it Jack that does the thumbnail? Yep, Jack, I yep. don't know why I always forget, but Jack, you're killing it. Thank you so much. I super appreciate it. Every time I see a thumbnail, I'm just like, that is it. Like, that's it. Um, what else do we do here? Oh, if you want to reach out. Uh, oh, this is definitely something I'm going to say. Real quick, when we are in the fast, I would ask for mercy for our person who corresponds. Um, contact at royalpath.network. I was just talking to them, and she was talking about how she's falling behind. I'm like, I'm going to say something. During a fast, when you send uh, an email to contact at royalpath.network, which is the official way to contact us, 
Um, please be merciful. It might take a little bit longer. She's running behind. She's got her own stuff on top of the spiritual struggle, the fast on top of, you know, the other things that she's got going on in her life. So be merciful, you know, and, you know, if you need a timely, timely response, maybe express that you need like a response pretty quickly. Um, but, you know, circumstances and such. Um, and uh, then you also some people will still reach out to Andrew, pa Andrew at Royal Path Network, and you can do that. But all year round, just be merciful to me because I'm not nearly as kind <laughs> to people. During the fast, be merciful to contact at Royal Path. All year round, just be nice to me because, I mean, I'm just horrible at responding to people. And I think that is it. So That's thank it. you for having a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.